awkward yeah. silence. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a non-awkward silence. <laughs> Hi, good evening. Welcome, everyone. I'm Cheryl Davis, and I'm very honored to be publicity slash moderating uh, this unfinished works screenplay reading and workshop series featuring emerging women writers finale. Uh, I'm pleased to be reading tonight, and and you will be free and welcome, and we solicit your comments and your critiques and your thoughts. On this piece tonight, it's called Song and Praise, written by Mesa Chang. Uh, some of the little background fine print of our presentation. Uh, the Film Lab is a not-for-profit company that runs year-round programming and screenplay workshops like this one to the 72-hour shootout filmmaking competition to its own in-house socially conscious entertainment content. You can read more about us at Film Lab at filmlab, film-lab.org. The Film Lab's Unfinished Works program allows you, the audience, to take the driver's seat in helping a new and emerging writer develop her script and storyline. I'm going to ask all of you to silence your phones and contribute your thoughts after our reading. That said, I am, as I said at the top of the show, uh, Cheryl Davis. By day, I'm a mild-mannered midtown Manhattan attorney, <laughs> <laughs> general counsel of the Authors Guild. Uh, by night, I'm a writer. I'm currently working on my first episode for Law and Order SVU. Woo! Woo! <laughs> I've won awards for TV and for and for stage writing. And here is Mesa Chang. Would, would she like to stand up so that the people who are not present can see her and people in the back? Yay, Mesa! <laughs> Mesa is a Brooklyn-based filmmaking writer who has lived many lives. As a competitive figure skater, which I think is hella cool, yeah. <laughs> headhunter, and now filmmaker. She draws on her experiences to tell character focused stories that star people underrepresented in mainstream media. Come to Film Lab's actor repertory. We have your Ariel Estrada. An entertainer, producer, and arts administrator. <laughs> <laughs> and helps nonprofit organizations get their miss, miss, mission sorry, for through the new lips and message out into the world. <laughs> <laughs> was recently inducted into the New York Foundation for the Arts Emerging Arts Leader Boot Camp Program. Go, Ariel! We are in Hippie Wei Ching Ho, a New York based actor. She's a veteran stage performer and speaks both Mandarin and Cantonese fluently. You don't get a chance to see. <laughs> <laughs> the latter being her native tongue. Other works she's known for include Daredevil, <laughs> The Sorcerer's Apprentice, and Robot Story. And here's Jennifer Baby Dad. <laughs> Search Party, Royal Pains. She's a writer, yeah, it is a fairy tale. And a writer producer. Mm -hmm. La La Land, uh, Immigrants, We Are Them, They Are Us, and Mirror Mirror. She's received mentions by the New York Times, Broadway World, and Backstage Magazine for her acting work. And Jennifer also has the distinction of having a day named after her in New York City. <laughs> May 9th, 2019. Go, Jen. <laughs> vegan dining with her husband <laughs> and running with her beloved rescue mutt. I don't know. Oh. <laughs> and we have here Roy Koshi, an actor, director, and comedian. <laughs> in addition to numerous theatrical productions, he's acted in videos for AdultSwim.com and Best Company, and he can be seen in the feature films How to Be Single and Abuse of Disorder. He's, in, he's performed improvisation and sketch comedy at the Magnet Theater. The Annoyance Theater as a graduate of American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York. He also performs with Story Pirates and various other educational theater companies around New York City. Okay. <laughs> we are about to do a table read of Song and Grace. And this is going to be a little different this time because it is a short piece, but we also have Chinese language folks be spoken in it. Um, is it Mandarin or Cantonese? I'm going to speak in Cantonese. Cantonese. So we're going to actually read through the script one time in English. Uh, we'll point out when the character's song is speaking Cantonese. And then we'll read through it again when she will actually be speaking Cantonese. 
So and we're, afterwards, we're going to have a moderated discussion uh, utilizing the Liz Lerman technique, which you're going to learn more about later. <laughs> now we have the song and break. Song and Grace, a short film by Mesa Chiang. Interior, cluttered apartment living room, morning. A closed window with a view of a nearby brick building. Song, 70, a spry, stylish, Chinese-American woman in a leg brace moves rest with restless energy after being cooped up in her apartment for the past two months thanks to a knee injury. She refuses to let the injury or a cane slow her down. Song tries to open the window. It's stuck. She throws all her might into trying to get that window open. It refuses to budge. She turns away as if to give up, but at the last moment darts back and pries it open a crack with her cane. Interior, cluttered apartment living room, afternoon. Curtains flutter gently in the breeze. Pull back to reveal a one bedroom apartment packed with a lifetime's worth of stuff. Scattered on various surfaces are origami, handmade silk flowers, and a Chinese newspaper. The walls are decorated with Asian art and calligraphy. Song inflates a thin balloon with an air pump. Her laptop is open to a web page titled Better English Now. The words, hello, my name is Song, are displayed, which a male voice with a neutral newscaster accent reads back. Hello, my name is Song. As Song ties the balloon end into a knot, she repeats the sentence slowly with a heavy Chinese accent. Hello, my name is Song. How was your day? How was your day? Song puts twist after twist in the balloon. Her English is hesitant. On the table are three framed photos. One of a woman in her 40s, Song's daughter. One of a young woman in her 20s, Song's granddaughter. One featuring Song, her daughter and granddaughter in graduation cap and gown, standing stiffly in a row. In front of the photos sits a pile of shiogami paper or origami. What a wonderful gift. Thank you. What a wonderful gift. Thank, Thank you. Thank, Thank. Thank you. Thank. Song's hands tightened around the balloon dog and it pops. After a moment of stunned dismay, she slaps the laptop closed. This is pointless. I'll never... The upper timer goes off. Song retrieves a bamboo steamer from the kitchen and sets it on the dining table. She cracks the steamer open to reveal three piping hot char siu bao, fluffy white buns. Interior, cluttered apartment living room, sunset. The fading light of the sunset filters through the window. Song fidgets on her couch. Glances from the Xiangqi, Chinese chess set, in front of her to the door to the, uh, to the ticking clock, tiny and alone in her apartment. On the dining table, there's a huge spread, including a teapot, flower arrangement, Chinese food, and the bamboo steamer. But no one to enjoy it at all. Interior, cluttered apartment living room, evening. Curtains flutter in the evening air the wind sending two origami lilies from the table to the floor. As Song goes to retrieve them, there's a knock. She smooths down her hair and straightens her shirt. At the door is Grace, 25, hauling a purse and multiple tote bags, clad in a white blouse, blue cardigan, and ergonomic shoes. It's been a long day spent working with difficult patients in a pharmacy on the other side of New York City. She holds the only three helium-filled celebratory balloons that were left in the store. Granddaughter, you are late. I, yes, oh, I'm sorry. There was an incident with a patient. The, the cops came. It was this whole thing. But um, but I brought balloons and the cake. Great. And Grace rusts the balloons towards Song while she bends to down to search the tote bags for the cake. Song stares at the balloons in amusement. They say, "Congrats, new grad. It's a boy." And my sympathies. <laughs> Wait, where's Grace mutters to herself as it becomes apparent that the cake is not in one of her many bags. Back. The cake is in the freezer on the other side of the world. 
Song ties the balloons to the table leg by the window. And I know that those aren't um, exactly birthday themes, but Mom said you're really into balloons now, and I didn't have time to... Anyway, happy birthday, Grandma! Grace repeats, happy birthday, Grandma, in slow, heavily accented Chinese. She stops, switches to Chinese, opens tea tin, and drops a flowering tea bundle into a clear glass teapot. Do you want tea? I have chrysanthemum you like. Grace has difficulty following. I don't. Can you speak a little slower? Grace repeats in Chinese the word slow. Where is your mother? This is going to be so difficult without her. Her uh, mom? Her, her flight got canceled and she has to wait till tomorrow to fly back. Didn't you, didn't you see my text? Great. Now we have no way to communicate. Hey, where's your cell phone? You know you're supposed to always have it on you. What if you fall again? I don't know what you're saying, but I recognize that Tom. You haven't lived long enough to earn the right to lecture me. Now I know you're talking to your best friend for this. <laughs> <laughs> Song's gaze falls on the Xianqi set. She gestures excitedly at it. It's late, and you must be hungry. Is it late? <laughs> um, I better go to this other street. What page is it? Sorry. <laughs> well, I happen. Oh, I see. I should be reading this English version. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> this is a workshop, right? <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, but I don't have the new script in English. Let's share. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to play a game of uh, John Kay? I've been trying to qualify for the league but I haven't been able to practice with anyone thanks to this stupid me. None of my friends can make it upstairs anymore. Is that... Sorry, I haven't played that since Chinese school. I don't, I don't even remember what any of the pieces are. Song groups. <sighs> it's late, and you must be hungry. I made you your favorite. Just about. Song presents the now cold buns in the steamer. Oh, that's... I can't. I'm, I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> but you used to love my cooking when you were small. Grace looks around the apartment. Um, do you want to watch TV or a movie? We can watch something in Chinese with English subtitles. No, no more TV. All I do is watch TV. Sometimes I get so bored sitting inside this apartment, I want to scream until the neighbors think I'm being murdered. Grace doesn't understand most of what Song is saying. I guess no. I don't know how to make you understand me. Grace looks towards the door. Maybe, maybe we should do this another time when, when Mom comes back. Grace begins to gather her purse and tote bags together. Song reaches out but can't find any words. She looks down at the remnant of her deflated balloon animal on the floor. Grace finishes up packing and looks at Song, hoping she'll ask her to stay. But Song doesn't notice her gaze. Grace's face falls, and she turns towards the door. A gust of wind blows through the window, blowing the helium balloons down to the floor. As they drift up again, Song has an idea. She grabs the box of thin balloons and the air pump. She inflates a red balloon ties it. She's halfway to making a dog shape when the balloon pops. Song stares stunned at the pieces of the broken balloon. Grace touches Song's shoulder. Grace holds out a blue inflated balloon. Song smiles and twists it into a hat, presents it to Grace and mimes putting it on her head. Grace puts it on her head and strikes a pose. Song makes herself a red matching balloon hat and puts it on. Montage. Grace pours hot water into the teapot on the table. A balloon. 
song shows Grace how to make a basic twist in a balloon. A balloon pops in Grace's hands and they laugh. Song shows Grace how to make a butterfly shape. Grace works on twisting something else from a red balloon. End montage. Grace holds up a heart-shaped balloon. It's crooked. Song accepts it. She struggles to speak. Song and Grace lean forward, foreheads practically touching over the Chang Chi set. Song points at each piece and says its name in Chinese and English. Grace repeats after her. Rack focus to the flowering tea in the glass teapot on the table in front of them, which has come into full bloom. Finny. <laughs> Interior, cluttered apartment living room, morning. A closed window with a view of a nearby brick building. Song, 70, a spry, stylish Chinese-American woman in a leg brace, moves with restless energy after being cooped up in her apartment for the last two months, thanks to a knee injury. She refuses to let the injury or cane slow her down. Song tries to open the window. It's stuck. She throws all her might into trying to get that window open and refuses to budge. She turns away as if to give up, but at the last moment, darts back and fries it open a crack with her cane. Interior, cluttered apartment living room, afternoon. Curtains flutter gently in the breeze. Pull back to reveal a one-bedroom apartment packed with a lifetime's worth of stuff. Scattered on various surfaces are origami, handmade silk flowers, and a Chinese newspaper. The walls are decorated with Asian art and calligraphy. Song inflates a thin balloon with an air pump. Her laptop is open to a web page titled Better English Now. The words, hello, my name is Song, are displayed, which a male voice with a neutral newscaster accent reads back. Hello, my name is Song. As Song ties the balloon end into a knot, she repeats the sentence slowly with a heavy Chinese accent. Hello, my name is Song. How was your day? How was your day? Song puts twist after twist in the balloon. Her English is more hesitant. On the table are three framed photos. One of a woman in her 40s, Song's daughter. One of a young woman in her 20s, Song's granddaughter. One featuring Song, her daughter, and granddaughter in graduation cap and gown, standing stiffly in a row. In front of the photos sits a pile of chiyogami paper for origami. What a wonderful gift. Thank you. What a wonderful gift. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Song's hands tighten around the balloon dog and it pops. After a moment of stunned dismay, she slaps the laptop closed. Hey, I'm all young now. You do what I'm doing. The oven timer goes off. Song retrieves a bamboo steamer from the kitchen and sets it on the dining table. She cracks the steamer open to reveal three piping hot char siu bao, fluffy white buns. Interior, cluttered apartment living room, sunset. The fading light of sunset filters through the window. Song fidgets on her couch, glances from the Xiang Qi Chinese chess set in front of her to the door to the ticking clock, tiny and alone in her apartment. On the dining table, there's a huge spread, including a teapot, flower arrangement, Chinese food, and the bamboo steamer, but no one to enjoy it at all. Interior, cluttered living apartment room, evening. Curtains flutter in the evening air, the wind sending two origami lilies from the table to the floor. As Song goes to retrieve them, there's a knock. She smooths down her hair and straightens her skirt. At the door is Grace, 25, hauling a purse and multiple tote bags, clad in a white blouse, blue cardigan, and ergonomic shoes. 
It's been a long day spent working with the difficult patients in a pharmacy on the other side of New York City. She holds the only three helium-filled celebratory balloons that were left in the store. Yes, I'm sorry. There was an incident with a patient. Cops came. It was a whole thing. But, um, but I brought balloons and, and cake. And, uh, Grace thrusts the balloons towards Song while she bends down to search the tote bags for a cake. Song stares at the new balloons in bemusement. They say, congrats, new grad. It's a boy. And my sympathies. Where's... Grace mutters to herself as it becomes apparent that the cake is not in any of her many bags. Crap. The cake is in the freezer on the other side of the world. Song ties the balloons to the table leg by the window. And then, uh, I know those aren't exactly birthday themed, but mom said you're really into balloons now, and I didn't really have time for it. Oh. Anyway, happy birthday, Grandma. Grace repeats happy birthday, Grandma, in slow, heavily accented Chinese. Mi mi shuang yu kuai la. <clears throat> she stops, switches to Chinese, opens tea tin, and drops a flowering tea bundle into a clear glass teapot. Grace has difficulty following. I don't. Can you speak a little slower? Grace repeats in Chinese the word slow. <laughs> Mom, um, her, her flight got canceled and she has to wait till tomorrow to fly back. Uh, did, didn't you get my text? <sighs> Where's your cell phone? We know you're supposed to have it on you. What if you fall again? Long's gaze falls on the Xiangqi set. She gestures excitedly at it. Sorry, I, I haven't bathed since proud since Chinese school. I, I don't even remember what any of the pieces are. I... Song groups. Song presents the now cold buns in the schemer. Oh, that's uh, I can't. Uh, I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> Grace looks around the apartment. Um, do you want to watch TV or a, a, a movie? We can we can watch something with Chinese subtitles. TV. Grace doesn't understand most of what the song is saying. I guess, no. Hmm. Uh, no. Grace looks towards the door. Maybe, you know, maybe we should do this another time, like when, when mom comes back. Grace begins to gather her purse and tote bags together. Song reaches out but can't find any words. She looks down at the remnant of her deflated balloon animal on the floor. Grace finishes packing up and looks at Song, hoping she'll ask her to stay, but Song doesn't notice her gaze. Grace's face falls as she turns towards the door. A gust of wind blows through the window, blowing the helium balloons down to the floor. 
As they drift up again, Song has an idea. She grabs a box of thin balloons and the air pump. She inflates a red balloon, ties it. She's halfway to making a dog shape when the balloon pops. Song stares, stunned, at the pieces of broken balloon. Grace touches Song's shoulder. Grace holds out a blue inflated balloon. Song smiles and twists it into a hat, presents it to Grace and mimes putting it on her head. Grace puts it on her head and strikes a pose. Song makes herself a red matching balloon hat and puts it on. Montage. Grace pours hot water into the teapot on the table. A balloon flies away from Grace. Song shows Grace how to make a basic twist in a balloon. A balloon pops in Grace's hands and they laugh. Song shows Grace how to make a butterfly shape. Grace twists, works on twisting something else from a red balloon. End montage. Grace holds up a heart-shaped balloon. It's crooked. Song accepts it. She struggles to speak. Thank you, Grace. Song and Grace lean forward, forwards, foreheads practically touching over the Shang-Chi set. Song points at each piece and says its name in Chinese and English. Grace repeats after her. Zhang, Zhang, Ma, Ma. Rack focused to the flowering tea in the glass teapot on the table in front of him which has come into full bloom. Fun. Thank you all so much. Now we're going to start with the feedback, and we're going to start with the actors who have spent, other than Mesa, the most time in the play. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start by asking the actors, one by one, can you please tell us what you liked about this? Um, or we can start with Ariel. Oh <laughs> yeah. Um, especially in the second reading, I just really loved uh, that. Um, it just really came alive definitely in the second reading where he was speaking Cantonese. Just um, they were communicating, but not communicating at the same time, and that sort of struggle to communicate was. I don't know, like it was really funny and really, it was really uh, compelling to, to watch you to do that. And um, I think like it's just feeling that, um, I guess like as just watching from the side, I'm rooting for these two people to find a connection, to finally understand each other. So that's what I really love about it. Kind of bouncing off that, that felt, it felt very genuine without being um, like I, I had a Chinese grandma who spoke mainly Chinese, and this is so very real. It felt very, very real. And then also just I, I found the vegetarian mind very, very funny. <laughs> very, very real. Like so, in, in, in real life, I was like, oh, grandma, like I can't have that. I'm a vegetarian, and she's like, it's just a little meat. It's fine. <laughs> and so like, no, but it just felt very, very genuine without being at all forced. So it's very nice. Oh, it's my turn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I also uh, um, <clears throat> identify with the uh, relationship of this lack of communication um, in the language barrier. But deep down inside, there is this grandmother and granddaughter, um, the, 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 the tie between them. And it's very frustrating on the one hand because we really cannot understand each other. But yet, deep down inside, there is still this. Uh, between them. Um, yeah. Um, and I found it's interesting that she actually does this balloon. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of unusual choice for, for a grandmother. But why not, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's uh, kind of fascinating, actually, that, that she would struggle with this. It's like a clown would do this twisting balloons, right? Um, yeah, that, I really like that choice. Because there was one chunk that I was totally unprepared for. It was the, <laughs> the, the, the chess game. <laughs> it was not in my original script, so I didn't look at it. So I was kind of, it was translated. I don't even, oh, I God. couldn't even find it. It was translated into Mandarin, but then I was, oh, I was a bit on the fly. 
was fine. But that was also interesting that she she liked to play the um, the Chinese chess game, uh -huh. which is totally alien to me. As I said, I can't play chess to save my life, mm -hmm. so I'm always very happy to have somebody else. Mm -hmm. Out of my comfort zone. Which shows that she's very smart. <laughs> I, I kind of love the song. She's so, um, she's totally fun loving. She loves, I mean, it's really clear that she's, she loves, you know, she loves her food, she loves art, she loves, she has all these wonderful things in her apartment that show her personality. And, um, you know, and also the, the whole cane sequence is hysterical, right? Uh -huh. sort of like, you can you can identify. Right, you can absolutely. Yeah. Identify. And like it's like you know, she's like she doesn't let anything stop her. Right? And she's very um, she's very clearly like the go getter, but also fun loving in a way that, I, that clearly her daughter um, granddaughter sorry clearly her granddaughter hasn't gotten. <laughs> she's very she's not particularly fun loving. Very like she's like. She looks a little stressed out when she comes in, right? So, um, and I also love that it's sort of touched on sort of deeper themes about like what does it mean to assimilate in this, in this society and country, right? And what you sacrifice. I mean, and what you what the human what you really sacrifice is the human cost, right? Of, of being able to communicate between like a granddaughter like between generations becomes impo nearly impossible. Right? And you have to come up with all these. Luckily, her grandma is very artistic and creative, and also refuses to give up and <laughs> figures out a way to communicate anyway. But which is wonderful. But most people don't get that, which is also one of the deeper things I saw. Let me turn to the audience. Like, as you see fit, what did you enjoy about the piece? And next, we'll come back to what questions you may have. But we're starting with what did you enjoy about the. Piece? First of all, I would say, you know, when, when non-communication happens as a barrier of talking, therefore you have this wonderful, wonderful sensate thing to do together. And you could see it visually as a film, uh, with a beautiful, you know, working with the, I guess these balloon animals, and they're animals, which is a completely different resonation, because you're talking in a very different way, and they're actually just very sensate and beautiful that way. So that aspect, right away, when non communication happened, when you just really say, visually and, and film is beautiful. That part, I very much appreciate to see how that can immediately be spot on on film. Yes, me. Um, I like the, the relationship between the young woman and granddaughter, and how it was never a question, because um, Grace showed up knowing that she wouldn't be able to communicate, you know, knowing that there was going to be a problem there. But, you know, um, they, they, you know they, they, she was willing to, to go and try that. I mean, she didn't say, like, hey, mom, call, call grandma and say I can't make it because, you know, what, you know, there was no question there. It was, like, love, it was, through, you know, through the whole piece, it was just really, really nice. It's not, that's not the question. Yeah, I, I came in a little late, but I, I understand the communication aspect. Um, my grandparents came from Japan, and I really couldn't communicate, but we did things together. And by sharing, you know, her her craft, she was a person who made little crochet pieces, and through that, I could enjoy what she was doing. Uh, but what I regret is, since I couldn't communicate with her, I couldn't find out about her life earlier. So that was the negative part of it. Okay. I just wanted to offer up my, my own two cents because I love the fact that you're dealing with communication in different ways. And communication because it uh, includes so much more than verbal communication as we saw from the piece. And the fact that the balloons are so visual and also the, the blossoming chrysanthemum in the glass, which helps you show the passage of time. Which is also a very beautiful image, and also in terms of passage of time, I could easily see like the number of balloons building up around them. So we realize that they spent all of this time together, and there's a lot of stuff you can do in film to show the passage of time in that way. 
And I also love the use of the cane that she's very good at like kind of repurposing. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> and I kind of thought when Grace was going to leave that she was going to like suddenly get a cane around her ankle. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll have to thank the whole Hitchcockian thing. Like, there's a cane, there's a gun, it's got to get used. <laughs> <laughs> and I love and I love the humor in your piece because it's a, it's such a touching tale, but there's also a lot of laughter involved, as you got to hear from the audience. Mm -hmm. um, actors, did you have any questions? Did it prompt any thoughts? Okay. Let's start with Ariel. Uh, <laughs> I already said a book. Uh, uh, um, questions. I would. I guess I would ask, um, you know, what the, I mean, clearly the, the, the third character is the mom. <laughs> There's a third unspoken character, the, the mom in there. Um, and I, I guess I just wanted, my, my question is asked, who is, this, who is mom? <laughs> who is mom and like, why did she, you know, did we see the results of what she, of her life? And what the choices she had to make in her life to in order to succeed in the US, right? Which is the, the cost of that with the inability to communicate. Mm -hmm. Right? So in some ways won't make this easier, but you know, I still wanted to know about her anyway. <laughs> Although you learn a lot, uh, you probably learn a lot from that picture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> from that picture of the three of them together. Because it's so stiff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I basically have to ask the same question. And my question would be to, I, I just assume that Song has not been in this country long because she's still just started. So she obviously has just come from China. So, the, you know, my question is like, well, of course, as an actor, mm -hmm. I mean, otherwise, she would have already had some favor. And this is a very, I mean, they really cannot communicate. So obviously the, the daughter is in the middle. So is it because the daughter is always there mm -hmm. that that I had no need to do this? And this is what forces, forces me to to communicate with her? Or is it because I'm just like so fresh off the boat? <laughs> I mean, it's just questions. You know, yeah. in the back and and, and it's just that the writer need not answer any questions at this exactly. point. This is really just for you just like to yeah. Yeah. answer. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's it. And as, as I get, uh, again, also the relationship with um, you know, my daughter, her mom, you know, what, what kind of relationship. And where's the grandfather? <laughs> where's my son in law? Sort of what is the normal status quo dynamic between these three characters? 
Rogers, as you all said. Uh, and um, I was wondering, because uh, Song keeps bringing up, like, um, you know, certain things from Grace's childhood, and in this scene, Grace is sort of like, I haven't seen that for a while. I just wonder if that's a pattern. Like, it's something that, like, Song, like, because that's, I know, like, I have family that, like, you'll tell them something a million times, and then <laughs> next time you see them, they're just like, hey, you still, like, play soccer? And like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> so like I, I just wonder like if that's if that's just an ongoing pattern, an ongoing dynamic between especially between you two. Um, and I was wondering also, uh, and not that we would have to see this in the film, but like I wonder when Song is not injured, like what is her life like? Does she go out and about? Does she's you know does she have friends? Is there a community that she's found that she's found for herself? I ask one of the questions that came up to my mind is sort of like when you mentioned that, sort of like what if she's been in the States for a long time, or sort of like when you said if she's in the States or if she just put it's fresh off the boat, right? If she's been in the States for a long time, because she does say that she has like lots of friends and stuff, right? So that they can't come up anymore, and I can't go out. Ah, I'm really, really crazy in this apartment for the past two months, right? It, is it? What kind of? I mean, did they come? It, I, it makes me ask questions about like what kind of economic status they were in when they came here, and that um, that she that she built that they built up stuff over time, where the mom gets to travel, has a job where she's traveling, and the granddaughter has this this that she's a, a med. Uh, you know, he's a medical professional, so it's like clearly they've really climbed up. But again, it's sort of like ideas of sacrifice. Like, it makes me question what she had to sacrifice to be here. You know, and what kind of jobs and stuff, and what kind of climb they had to make to get there. Yes. Well, like everyone else, I enjoyed the because I find it relatable. I see so many friends of mine have miscommunication between their older generations too. So it's very relatable. I also know a grandmother who has a lot of balloons. But I do have a question to the author is that about the theme. Because in the first act we know that um, Grace, she is kind of not really care about visiting grandma. She even bought a wrong balloon and didn't forgot about the cake. I thought that the themes would be also about her nonchalance to all this relationship. But the, um, in the whole short film, we see that the grandma is being proactive to all like building communication. I was expecting Grace would also be more proactive in this in this um, relationship too on the on the nonchalance problem and also on the miscommunication problem. For me, without I agree with what um, the questions that all the actors are talking about. Because right away it was like, okay, these uh, Grace and are coming from college, and then this woman is only seventy years old. She's seventy years old. Okay, maybe I'm a little older, but it feels like a very young grandma. <laughs> I'm like, what the? She, you know, so obviously something's a bit like I'm, I'm kind of wondering exactly what you guys are saying. Like, how long has she been living here, and how long has? Because it felt like she's alone somehow. How long has she been here? Therefore. At, at, at which point she can't even get the language together. Go, go, you know, I speak Chinese, go, jong, jong, and everything, my mother. So that part was very interesting, especially also the social economic situation that I would like to have it more, like, um, a little grounded there in, in terms of social economic situation and how often, indeed, how the mother, the actual mother of, um, Grace. comes over. Um, you know, to visit her, and how long has she been in this country? At which point she's been just trying trying to learn English. So I said, was she be, is she only here one year? So that part is interesting. I mean, just all these questions that to ground it a little bit, just to have that incredible, beautiful carpet of knowing where where at and whereby everything is more poignant and resonating. Um, the question of social economic situation and the Upper, you know, they're Upper East Side, or you know, coming from opposite. Area, like, where's just to know where the the mother, grandmother's living? All these kind of points, little bits here. Um, so, kind of want to build off of that. I think one of the questions that I had was like, 
which of Song's habits are things that she's built through her life, and which ones are built out of the frustration of not being able to leave her apartment, like with the, the current injury that she has. Um, because I don't know, like, if, if she's been trying to learn English for quite some time, or, like, literally she's, like, bored. Mm -hmm. And like she took up t origami and <laughs> 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 and learning English because uh, you know that she had all this time and she can't go out and she can't see her friends. Um, as far as like how long she's been in this country, I guess I I mean I come from a family of immigrants as well, and uh, I know a lot of uh, I mean the Latino community. I know a lot of people who came here 20 years ago and still are have very limited English speaking. So I guess that part to me didn't seem, I'm not sure, I don't know enough about the Chinese American community to know if you can kind of, but I also live in Queens, so I kind of feel like you can um, have these pockets of the world where you move through with very limited English speaking skills and, and get through for a long time. I just had one idea. I don't mean to offend it. You could replace the leg injury with dementia. And uh, could be a funny setting where a demented person is trying to learn the language, doesn't go anywhere, and granddaughter is like, she's used to it, just she's not even interested. You kind of might explain all these questions we have, why there is not enough communication or why there is not enough attempts for a granddaughter to... I mean, I live through this with my mother, so I don't... It would be very funny because my wife bought for my mother a book of aphorisms, and she kept on reading only one page and laughing, and would not flip a page. And I said, come on, flip a page, go for it. No, no, this is very good. And keeps... Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, so that explosion of language, like, when she gets frustrated, like, that was very, very relatable. Yeah. Yeah. Or even just to, it's just a very surprising, I think, for some people that Chinese is a very dramatic language for Chinese. So my question was about the introduction of technology in it. Like, so it's either leave it in or leave it out or make it, because you, you offer a way of communication without the balloons. You know, she had some computer. Um, Grace asked about her cell phone. So these items could be used to help bridge the uh, uh, communication gap. But then they sort of disappear. You know, and they don't. They're not used as as potential tools. So I feel like if if they're removed, it could make that make that struggle a little more understood because they're like they're really stuck. Whereas you know, if you, have, if you had a cell phone, you know, that could potentially translate into a Chinese text or the grandma, like, it's just something, um, because I know with, you know, my grandma, if there was something, like, we didn't understand, we'd just look over the dictionary or something, but to not have that bridge to make it just more isolating and have to communicate through the chess game or the balloon, to, to, so to not have that, um, to those tools there, I guess. Mm -hmm. voice to voice. Yeah. I've seen voice to voice. Yeah, so speak like one language and it speaks yeah, to another. But, but sometimes translates it bad. <laughs> yeah, but like that's there and then you're like, why yeah, it's would they idea. just... Yeah, like why wouldn't they just use those? So, Google Translate. Right, to so just not have it in. Like, she's like, oh, well, they don't have these things, so they need to, they need to find a way. Right. So. But there is a lack of body language. Yeah. Like my my in-laws don't speak English at all, and uh, I tried with phones, and write it's very difficult, mm -hmm. and it's mainly body language and borrowing words from Russian or German, and that's how we, or I bother my wife, <laughs> but there is a need for body language for gesticulations yeah. and everything without that. Absolutely scattered. <laughs> 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 
visualize that and it's very sweet to me and I um, I feel like even just there's again more visual stuff about how they connect to the balloons and you could feel the warmth you know even without the, the conversation or through tran translation that still the warmth comes through and, and that they're trying to connect you know and so that's very present I had a question for the for the uh, one who wrote this script. As far as grandma, does grandma is she running away from something initially when she comes to this country, and and you know is that a circumstance which maybe keeps her isolated, or is it um, a scenario where she's been here, maybe illegally, <laughs> illegal alien, and and so she doesn't want the quasi city officials to find her. So, you know, I'm curious, is that part of the thinking of what you were writing, or is it totally different? Well, oh, the writer doesn't mean to answer. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> she, she, she wishes to, she can, but that's not Okay, all right, that's fine. Anyway, that's a, that's a thought I know. So I somehow missed that this was taking place in New York City, and in my head, it was in San Francisco. Um, so I kind of like, maybe there were enough hints that, I don't know, I just imagined it was in Chinatown in <laughs> San Francisco. But I kind of like that there were enough hints that this might be like an ethnic, an ethnic enclave somewhere, but it could be anywhere. So that it made it even more relatable um, in some way. And I don't know if that was, that was just, I was the only one who missed it, or someone else maybe just like transposed for themselves where it should be. That you mentioned, there was a Chinatown. That's actually where my grandma did live. <laughs> <laughs> and she actually lived here for a long time and did not really speak English. That's what it's really called. So, you know. But it is interesting to hear your speculation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> actually, you live in Chinatown. You yeah. don't need to have this feeling. Yeah. 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 Actually, I went to, to visit my, my sister lives in uh, Sydney, Australia. Uh, in a suburb outside of Sydney. I went to visit her. I almost spoke no English. <laughs> she would take me to to um, to drive me to uh, to this another suburb or something. All Chinese, it's like Chinatown. Mm -hmm. But and it's everybody speaks Cantonese or But I barely and I of course I spoke Chinese to her all the time. So I spoke it's until a friend of mine came to pick me up and took me to, to Bondi Beach. And I thought, oh, suddenly I'm just speaking <laughs> 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 It's so, it's not a Chinese now. I guess if you don't really, you know, just associate with, mm -hmm. with uh, your fellow compatriots, mm -hmm. you know, you can get away with it. Mm -hmm. I just thought sound would be like more you know, conquer. <laughs> English is not a lot. Question: I I had no problem with the uh, her not knowing English, but my then I question why now is she choosing to learn it? I wondered if was it a gift from grace. Uh, was it something to do with trying to connect with her? That's why I wonder, like, why are you taking these lessons now, and how does that affect the story? That's the question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any thoughts on the 
and two characters we have, or the voiceover. <laughs> and actually, a question we had from um, Lori when asked your question that you were asking about how we how to interpret the voiceover. No. Okay. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was, yeah. About the question you can pose to the audience, like, which do you, which do you think they should prefer? Well, yeah, I was just, um, I was talking with Mesa at the beginning, uh, before we began, uh, a lot of, like, trainings online try to sound very relatable, and they try to sound very human, like, it's some real person talking to you casually, uh, and kind of, I was trying to do that, uh, as opposed, because the description says neutral newscaster mm -hmm. accent, so I think the second reading I tried more of the neutral, more just straightforward giving information, just uh, responding robotically. Uh, the first one was more uh, kind of more conversational, I think, at least of my intention. And uh, within that, Mason brought up a good point of like. Part of like this reading was getting a sense of how she's receiving this voice. So not so much how the voice really sounds, but like when I repeat thank you, thank you, thank you, yeah. uh, it's difficult for her. It sounds like it's a mockery to her, even though the computer itself might not be doing that. So mm -hmm. that was something that we played. And then the second time I didn't do that as much. So I don't know if anybody if that was the I bring that in because we're, I was asked about the characters, and technically he's a character, he's a presence in the piece, and how, what did you think of what he added to the piece? So those are my, that's my question. I actually, I noticed that too, like delivering immediately, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, personally I had a preference for the second, and I, I don't really know if I can articulate why, mm -hmm. um, and I, I guess, like, I know it's supposed to be a computer, but in my head I was thinking kind of of like, like in, in movies in like I guess the 90s uh, where uh, someone would put on like a cassette to learn the language. Yeah. 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 And you like press a button and, and like press yeah. on a Walkman. <laughs> <laughs> so I the second reading I think would have called that more. <laughs> Is there anything more that people would like to see in the next episode? Do you want, uh, I guess what, if, if you're listening, gee, it would be interesting if. Do you have any thoughts along those lines? Yeah. yeah I, I kept wondering whether the granddaughter character was enjoying visiting her grandmother. Um, I, I mean, I, I just came off of a family visit where there was a lot of tension. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, you know, th literally three generations. Mm -hmm in the room, this is my family. So I, you know, I'm not trying to inject, I'm not trying to project anything. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I just what, you, I just could use more clarity, like, was this really annoying for her to have to go out of her way to, to visit her grandmother? You know, it's, it's kind of alluded to a little bit in the fact that the balloons weren't right and there was no cake, like, mm -hmm. you know, like, if this is her, if this is her birthday and it's 70 and that, a birthday with a zero is an important birthday. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like, I, I'm just curious as to whether there are other layers to the granddaughter that might make this, like, something that is either inconvenient for her or unpleasant for her. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also alluded to, not just that the balloons are off and there's no cake, but also it's alluded to by the absence of her daughter. Mm -hmm. um, and... Um, not to keep bringing my family into this, but um, <laughs> but, but, but in some ways it's easier for my mother to um, appreciate her grandchildren as sources of pleasure <clears throat> rather than as reflections of every way that she failed as a woman, <laughs> which is what her children are. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm, I'm like, I, 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 I know this is a little, this, no, this is a little stereotypically Asian, but I'm keeping it real. This is actually, this is actually true. Like, you know, and it's, it, you know, like, I keep hearing my mom say stuff to her grandchildren, like, I'm so proud of you. 
Um, or I love you. Stuff that is totally alien to me. But for some reason... That's not just alien. <laughs> um, so anyway, I'll pull my family out of this now. I'm not paying for the 55-minute app. Um, and um, I guess that's the question. Is the, is, is, is the granddaughter enjoying herself? And if she's not... I would be curious to, to know why. I'm also curious to know why the daughter is not there. Mm -hmm. I'd like to piggyback off of that a bit and wonder, because essentially you've got a, a triangle relationship with one point missing. And I feel like I kind of want to know what each of them feels about the absence of the mother. Is it frustration? Is it they both have their own, I'm sure their own issues with the daughter and the mother. <laughs> And I kind of was very curious about that. Is that what you complaining about? Like, of course, it would just like her to miss her flight because she always does this. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of was wondering about that kind of thing. That's also another way, definitely another way to bond <laughs> in some of the animal relationships. Especially about the person who's not in the room. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, no, sorry. You raised your hand. Right there. Yeah, I, I would also love to know more about Grace and have. Uh, more exposure to the different parts of her personality, although she's in an uncomfortable situation, so she might be a little locked up. But um, because I, I, I love the vitality of song mm -hmm. and the stubbornness, mm -hmm. and I can't imagine that without those things, um, any kind of communication would have worked. Mm -hmm. But I would like to imagine that there is something in grace that would kind of kick in if that weren't there, um, that would facilitate some kind of connection. Um, that's kind of a fantasy that I was having during the show, or <laughs> during the reading. Um, so I, I guess I would, I, I love, I loved it, and I would just love to see more, to understand Grace a little bit. Would you like to see more Grace pushing the action rather than, do you feel like Grace was reactive, or? I feel like she was, yeah, okay. reactive. Maybe slightly defensive. Okay. That was just an impression that I had, like protecting herself, maybe. Okay. And that's also something to bear in mind when you have so few characters on stage. Each character in each line, they say, becomes even more related. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe she might be. Yeah. <laughs> I, I kind of felt like maybe Grace was, was reacting that way because her mother was the one that always took the lead. Like, she was the translator, she was the connector, she was probably the one that was saying, Grace, you should do this, Grandma, you should be nicer to her. So, or whatever it is, you know, maybe Grandma loved her and told her, I love you all the time, but I'm not quite sure that that was what came across. So, I think that, that maybe that's what is a big presence that's been taken out of there, is the mother. And so that doesn't show up as much. Um, so, you know, while Grace's character is like not as emotive or, or as dynamic as, as song, I think that, that makes sense though, if that were the situation. Um, I think um, I would have liked to see that, and it's, I think it's kind of like what other people are saying is that the way, the way that it's coming to me is like um, that Grace. Um, So it, the way the way I saw it was like Grace, like kind of like just giving in to the frustration and like, oh, there's nothing I can do, and it's just like, it's like, ah, oh, shucks, can't speak to Grandma. You know, it's like where where it was to go in deeper into the frustration and reach for Grandma more, you know, like I don't know. How come you didn't make me the veggie bun? You know, mom yeah. told me you can't. Mom told me you can't. <laughs> <laughs> so, going in, so I'm like, <laughs> Wait a minute, she didn't bring the cake, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually, like, it's like, like, I just think back, I just think that as, like, a condition of grace, like, that's how grace is, you know? And grandma's okay with it because mom does smooth those things over but like like the, my previous comment was like I made it like to me the assumption that there was like that love was there you know like 
it, she wasn't like, to me, it wasn't like, oh, I'm bringing these balloons because I don't care. Like, I'm bringing balloons because I have to bring balloons to grandma, but she can't read them anyway, so she's going to love them. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's like, like, someone, someone said Grace, uh, what was the word? Me uh, not messy, but something Scatter. like that. Scattered. <laughs> and, that's, and that's the way it, it, it reads, and, and I don't think the relationship has an issue. You know, that's not, that's not, you know, I think I would have liked, I would have liked to see as much effort by Grace towards Grandma as Grandma put towards Grace. That's what I'm trying to say. Sorry. Okay. That's a good one. <laughs> so actually, that makes me think, I have a question about that, just because in the script, there's a point where Grace is like, okay, like, we'll just do this when Mom comes back. I give up. And she gathers all her stuff together, but she keeps looking at Grandma, like hoping, like she's not going to take the active role, but she's really hoping Grandma's going to take the active role and do something. And it says, Grace finishes packing up and looks at Song, hoping she'll ask her to stay. But Song doesn't even notice her gaze. So Song's not paying any attention. And then when Grace turns to leave, Song picks up the balloons and she's making a balloon animal. But it's not clear to me. I actually didn't think that she was making the balloon animal for Grace or to interact with Grace, I saw, thought she was just doing it out of whatever that reason was that she was making balloon animals in the first place, that she was, that she had also given up. Granddaughter is like, I really want you to ask me to stay. I feel really bad, but I don't know what to do, so I think I'm going to leave. Uh, and Grandma's like, I'm done with this too, and I'm just going to make a balloon animal. And so I actually thought it was Grace that made the overture because when Song burst the balloon, so Grace has paused now by the door, and she's bummed out, and she's like, are you going to say anything to me? No, you're just going to ignore me and make this balloon? And then Grandma's balloon pops, and she's like, hey, look, I'm going to make, I'm going to bump up this blue balloon and give it to you. So I actually thought Grace did make the overture, but maybe that's just how I read it, because I'm biased. <laughs> <laughs> Means that there's an opening there for interpretation. Mm -hmm. So I think that gives you guys the opportunity to decide which take mm -hmm. you want to, you want the characters to make, which take you want to shoot. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Do you have any more questions, thoughts? Talk with your cookies. Oh. <laughs> 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 um, where would you like to see this project go? Like, um, is it are you planning for it to be a short, a feature, or a... Yeah, yeah, a short film. No, not for a feature. That would be fun. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, I'm planning to um, direct and produce it in in the winter, you know, um, mm -hmm. hopefully February, <laughs> over a weekend, and yeah, no, that's basically then go to film festivals, and I would love to screen it around Chinatowns in, like, New York, like, all over, anywhere, anywhere anyone wants to see the short film. But I like that everyone brought so many personal stories, like family stories. To me, that's exactly what I wanted to hear. Like, that's what I want people to connect with, right? Across cultures, to be like, I've, I've had that issue with my grandmother. I've felt that frustration. I've felt that, like, oh, man, what, what am I even doing here? Like, why are you now? So, that's, so I'm very glad. Thank you all for being <laughs> Thank you all very much for coming. And you're all invited to Film Lab's next event. <laughs> which will consist of a TV comedy pilot screening at the International Human Rights Festival on December 14th. You can find out more about that on RSVP on film-lab.org. Thank you for coming.